Okay, today we're going to start doing some logic, and I want to start off by introducing you to something called Russell's Paradox, and a, just a tiny bit of history behind set theory. Okay, this is as a, as a closure for chapter one. So, the thing that you need to notice in the history of mathematics is that in the 17 and 1800s, okay, calculus was um, well known at this time, okay, and people were discovering and proving a lot of things. However, not all of their methods were entirely valid, okay? Like, I'll give you an example. One of the Bernoulli brothers proved that the harmonic series is divergent, okay? Let me write this down. Okay, so that was first proven. by Bernoulli. I don't remember off the top of my head which one, but I believe it was uh, John or Johann. Okay, and he, he was correct when he proved that. He was correct. It does diverge. However, his proof was not valid. How can that be the case, you might ask? How can you prove something that is, in fact, accurate, but your proof is not valid. Well, it's because the reasonings that he used in his proof do not always hold up, okay? And specifically, the problem was that he rearranged and grouped the terms of the harmonic series. And here's the thinking. We know that we have an addition. We know that addition is commutative and associative. And so you think to yourself, when I'm adding things together, I can rearrange and group the terms however I want. And that's true. And the thinking was an infinite series is really just a whole bunch of addition problems. And so I should be able to rearrange and group the terms however I want. And that's what Bernoulli did to prove that you would get a sum that goes to infinity. But after that, it was discovered that if you have infinitely many addition problems, then rearranging and grouping the terms can change the answer, you see? And so therefore, we now know that with an infinite series, you cannot rearrange and group the terms however you like, except in certain special cases. So, so Bernoulli's proof, even though it did come up with the accurate answer that the harmonic series diverges, the methods that he used in his proof were not logically valid, okay? So let's write that down. And so what, what happened? Well, to cut to the end of the story, we now have a different proof that is entirely sound that shows that the harmonic series diverges. But the point I want to make here is not just about the harmonic series. The point I want to make is that the mathematical community in the late 1800s, let's say, okay, they, they began to realize, okay, look, <clears throat> we need to have very specific sets of rules that we can rely upon because now that we're becoming more sophisticated, 
and dealing with more abstract things like infinity, we are realizing that some of these mathematical things behave very differently than your intuition might lead you to think. And so therefore, we better be really careful about what we're doing to make sure that what we're doing is logically sound. Some things that seem totally innocent, like rearranging terms in a series, are actually very dangerous. And so what they did was they set about, this is just, I, I say they, but I just mean the mathematical community as a whole, okay? Set about a program to try to set down some rules that could explain all of mathematics. And preferably, not like... 5,000 different rules, you know, a small set of rules upon which all of mathematics could be based. Kind of like Euclid tried to do with geometry, okay? And that's what set theory was meant to be. So let me write this down. Set theory was meant to give a succinct set of rules here let me let me write it like this upon which all of mathematics could be based. And this was the goal at the end of the 1800s and the first part of the 1900s. Okay. Um, the long and the short of it is that this was proven to be impossible, okay? Uh, it was proven that it is actually impossible to come up with a set of rules that can describe everything, okay? And I don't want to get too deep into that. That's a very, very deep discussion, okay? And that's not to say that set theory was a failure, okay? It just it just means to say that the the original scope of set theory was a little bit too ambitious. But set theory was was still a very big success in the sense that even though you can't describe all of mathematics using the rules of set theory, you can describe most of mathematics using the rules of set theory. Any mathematics that you ever see in your life, um, I'm confident in saying, can be boiled down to the rules of set theory and logic. Okay? Um, the person who proved that you cannot have rules that describe everything, he did not come up with something and say, oh, look, you can't prove this. What what he did was he just proved that no matter what rules you have, there's always going to be something that's true that can't be proven. That's all. Okay. So anyways, let's not get too far off the, off the main track. What I want to introduce you to is something called Russell's Paradox. And this was um, brought up by Bertrand Russell, who was an English, not really a mathematician, actually, although he was friends with a lot of mathematicians, but he was actually a philosopher. Okay. And what he did is he came up with something that shows that even defining the word set is going to cause some logical problems. Okay. And this is what he did. 
he said consider this set so I'm going to ask you a question what's a set a set is just a collection of things right and sets have elements and subsets and things like that so he said consider the set a which is the set here actually in the book is written with symbols but I think I think it will be easier to understand if I use words okay the set a as the set of all sets that are not elements of themselves. You might ask, oh, do you mean subsets of themselves? And I would say, no, I mean to say elements here. Okay, every set is a subset of itself, right? So Russell said, what about the set of sets that are not elements of themselves? And it's a reasonable question to say, well, how can a set be an element of itself? That's a reasonable question. And we don't need to get dragged down into that because the idea is this. If you have a set, right, unless that set is empty, then there are elements of that set, right? And so everything in the universe you could ask, is this an element of that set? Yes or no. Okay? And since the set is something that exists, then you can ask the question, is that set an element of itself? Yes or no? Okay? Probably no. It's very hard to think of an example of a set that would be an element of itself. <clears throat> okay? Um, so that's the set that Russell said to think about. And then he asked this question. Is A an element of itself? Okay, so we, so we have said this. We've said A is the set of all sets, let's say X, such that X is a set and X is an element, um, sorry, not an element of itself. Okay, and the question is, is A an element of A? So let's discuss that question. Is A an element of A? Okay, if you say yes, let's do no first actually. Okay, so, if you say no, then that means that A is not an element of itself, right? But what is A? It's the set of all sets that aren't elements of themselves. So if A is a set, and A is not an element of itself, then that means A is one of the sets in A. And there we have a logical contradiction, right? So you would say, okay, then no cannot possibly be the answer. 
So the answer must be yes, that A is an element of itself. Okay, so if A is an element of itself, and A is the set of sets that aren't elements of themselves, then that means that A can't be in that set, right? Let me say that again. A is the set of sets that are not elements of themselves. So if A is an element of itself, then A can't be in that set, and so it's not an element of A. And there we have another logical contradiction. Okay, because if A is not in A, then that means what? Well, actually, it's already written up there. I don't need to write it again. It's already written right here. Yes, A is an element of A, and, and because of that, A is not an element of A. That's our logical contradiction. Okay. So, whoops, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. So what Russell did was he showed that, hey, look, even, even something very, very simple as what is a set brings up logical difficulties. Okay? And so what does that mean? That means that you can't actually... You can't actually give a definition of a set that's not going to cause logical difficulties. And so therefore, set is oftentimes uh, thought of as what's called an undefined term. It means we, we just say it's just a collection of things. You know, it's like a, it's a common understanding that people have. Yeah, I can imagine what, what you mean by a set, a collection of things. Okay? But if you try to actually... Um, give a definition of set that you that you want to base everything upon, you know, Russell showed that even something as simple as that is going to cause logical problems. All right? That doesn't mean, again, that doesn't mean that set theory is wrong or useless. It just means that every attempt you make to give a logical basis for everything is going to bring up its own logical problems. That's the idea that was that Russell was trying to get across, okay? Set theory was meant to be a succinct set of rules that would describe everything in mathematics. And Russell was pointing out that when you try to do that, even the rules themselves are going to bring their own logical difficulties. Okay? So, just to end this discussion, what ended up happening? Well, what ended up happening is the mathematical community realized that their goal was not possible. They could not come up with a succinct set of rules that described everything. Uh, in fact, it, and it wasn't just Russell, it was a, there was a German man who, who actually proved that to be impossible. Okay, um, so did they just throw away everything? No, because like I said a little while ago, set theory does do a remarkably good job of explaining pretty much all of mathematics that you're ever going to encounter. So it was not at all a failure, just because it did not reach 100% of the goal does not mean it was a failure because 98% turns out to be pretty darn good. Okay? All right, so now, what we're going to do now is we're going to start Chapter 2. We're going to start getting into the actual rules of logic. And we're going to start at the beginning. Okay? And we are going to start with, what is a statement?
or another word for statement is predicate. I don't mean predicate like when you're in ninth grade and you learn to diagram sentences and you have a subject and a predicate. That's not what I mean. Okay. All right. So what this is, a statement or a predicate is something very, very specific. Okay. It is a sentence. That is definitely true or definitely false. Sorry, what am I doing? I'm misspelling that word. There we go. Okay, that's what a statement is. It's a sentence that is true or false. Not both. Okay. Definitely true or definitely false. That's what a statement is. All right. So I'm going to write down a few statements. All right, every number is divisible by two. That's a statement. Okay. In this particular case, that is definitely false. And the fact that it's definitely false means it's a statement. Okay? Here's another one. Every even number is divisible by 2. That one's true. Okay? Here's another one. 2 is an element of the integers. That is true. Okay, you see what I'm getting at here? A sentence that is true or false. That's what a statement is. And we call the truth or falsity of the statement is called its truth value. Okay, so so again, that first statement was false. The second statement is true. The third statement is true. Okay. That's called the truth value of the statement. Okay. Now, let me show you some examples of sentences that are not statements. So I'll call these non-examples, okay? If I said x is even, okay, that is not true and it's not false. It is neither. Okay, and you could you could explain that in two ways. One is you could say, um, here, I'm sorry, let me say this. You might say, well, technically that is false because X is a letter, not a number. Okay, so you could say, so it's definitely false, and that makes it a statement. But here I'm... <coughs> There's an understanding here, there, at least I meant for there to be an understanding, that I'm using x as a variable to stand for a number. Okay? All right, so. If x is standing for a number, and I write x is even, you might say this. You might say, well, it's definitely true or definitely false, depending upon what number x is standing for. But you see... That's the whole point. 
that statement is not definitely true because x could stand for the number 3. And it's not definitely false because x could stand for the number 4. You see? Some people like to say that sentence is sometimes true and sometimes false, which I guess is not incorrect. But I think that that's not where you want to put your energy into thinking about sometimes true and false. The question is very, very simple. Is it definitely true? The answer is no. Okay. Is it definitely false? The answer is no. All right, then it's not a statement. Okay. Here's another example of something that is not a statement. Add 5 to both sides. That's a sentence, but it's not a statement. Okay? In fact, you know, this is even further from being a statement than the first non-example. Okay? Because this isn't even this isn't even discussing something that is trying to be a fact. This is describing an action. I know in the English language you might call that a statement because we use the words statement and sentence more or less interchangeable in the English language. But in mathematics and in logic, that is not a statement because it is not something that is true and it's not something that's false. So it's not a statement. Okay, now, we will oftentimes, in order to make things uh, more succinct, we will oftentimes use variables to stand for statements. Okay, and these are called statement variables. And our book uses capital letters for that. I will try to stick with that um, convention. Okay, so here's a couple of examples that are given in the book. So let me write let me write this more examples of statements. Okay, so we could say for every integer n greater than 1 The number two n minus one is prime. Okay. Now, okay, let me just alert you to something right away. Whether that is true or false is of no concern to us right now. The only thing that is of concern to us is, is it definitely true or definitely false? I'm not concerned about which one. I'm just concerned of, is it definitely one of those two? A lot of times people fall into the idea here of, okay, we need to figure out, is that really true or not? Okay, and that's not the question right now. The question right now is just, is that a statement? So is it definitely true or definitely false? But I don't care which one. Just is it definitely one of those two? Okay, and without figuring out if it's true or false, I can figure out that it's definitely one of those two because if n is an integer, greater than 1, then I know for a fact that 2, n, uh, 2 to the n minus 1 is an integer greater than 1. And every integer greater than 1 is either prime or not prime. So this sentence is either true or it's false. I don't know which one off the top of my head, but I know that it's one of those two. And so that is a statement. So I can 
give this statement a name. We'll call it capital P. And then any time in, in that discussion that we are having, any time I would write capital P, you would know that capital P is that statement. Okay? Here's another one. Every polynomial of degree n has at most n roots. Okay, now that one I hope you know already that that is true. Okay, and we're going to call that statement Q. Okay, here's one more. The function f of x equals x squared is continuous. That's also true. But the fact that it's true is not what's important to me. The only thing that's important right now is whether or not that's a statement. So is it true or is it false? Okay. All right, now I'm going to introduce you to something that's called an open sentence. Okay. An open sentence is a sentence whose truth or falsity depends upon the value of one or more variables. Okay, we actually saw one of those up above. X is even. That is not a statement, but it is an open sentence. The truth or falsity of that depends upon the value of X. Okay, if you plug a specific value into X, then that sentence becomes true or false. So by plugging a number into that variable x, that sentence will turn into a statement. But when there's not a value plugged in, then it is neither true nor false, so it's not a statement. Okay, and I'm going to write down... Um, actually, I was going to write down another example, but but the example in the book is the same one, okay? It's just, let's write it again. It's written this way. The integer x is even. This is an example in the book given of an open sentence, okay? And you can use a letter to stand for that also. Let's call this one Q again. It's not the same Q that I listed up before, okay? Q. And what I will do is I'll write Q of X, okay? Because it depends upon the variable X, whether it's true or not, depends upon the variable X. Okay, so that's an open sentence. By itself, it is not a statement, okay? I'm going to write this down. Open sentences are 
by themselves not statements okay plugging in specific values to the variable or variables creates a statement. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that everything with a variable is an open sentence. Look at this example up here of P. That has a variable in it, right? And in fact, if I were to cross off the first half, and if I just wrote the whole number 2 to the n minus 1 is prime, then that would in fact be an open sentence not a statement, right? Because it depends upon the value of n. If n is, um, let's say, 3, then 2 to the n minus 1 would be 7, which is prime. But if n is 1, then 2 to the n minus 1 would be 1, which is not prime. So just that part right there, the number 2 to the n minus 1 is prime. That's an open sentence because it could be true or it could be false, depending upon the value of n. By putting this first part onto the sentence for every integer n greater than 1, that now takes that open sentence and turns it into a statement. Okay, not by plugging in something for n, but just the fact that I've put more information onto that has created a statement. Okay, but notice that there's still a variable n. So you can't just say, oh, if there's a variable, then it's an open sentence. It's not quite that straightforward because statements can have variables. Okay, and that one up there, we could even have called p of n if we wanted to. All right. Uh, we'll see how the book goes as we progress along. I try not to, myself personally, I try not to put things like, whoops, sorry. I try not to put things like P of N if it is not an open sentence. Okay, but you certainly can. But the important thing I want to, the important thing I want to point out though is just that if you're trying to figure out if something's an open sentence, it is a little bit more detailed than just saying, are there variables in it? Okay, the important thing is this, to decide if something is an open sentence or not. Does the truth or falsity depend upon what value is plugged into the variable? Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to read a few out of the book. I'm not going to write these all down, okay? Well, here, actually, let's do this. I can actually show it on this screen, so give me a second. Let's look at this uh, set of problems right out of the book, okay? There's 15 sentences, and it asks whether or not each one is a statement, okay? And then in the case of a statement, it says, um, say if it's true or false, if possible. Well, if, if it's easy, then we'll do that. But what I'm really concerned about is you being able to tell if it's a statement or not. Okay, so let's just run through them. Number one, every real number is an even integer. Is that a statement? I'm not asking you if it's true or not. I'm asking you if it is a statement. So if it's true, then it's a statement. If it's false, then it's a statement. If it is neither, or if it is sometimes one and sometimes another, then it's not a statement. 
Okay, so every real number is an even integer. What would you say about that? I would say that is a statement. It's a false statement. Okay, every even integer is a real number. What do you think about that one? That's a statement. That is true. All right, if x and y are real numbers and 5x equals 5y, then x equals y. What do you think about that? And again, don't say true or false. That's not what I'm asking. Say statement or not statement. That's what I'm asking. What do you think? That one is a statement. And it's a statement because it's true. If it were false, that would also be a reason to call it a statement. Okay? Notice there are variables in that statement. But the presence of the variables don't does not make it an open sentence. It's still a statement. Okay? Because it is true no matter what. Okay? All right. Sets Z and N. That's not a statement, right? Sets Z and N are infinite. That is a statement. Some sets are finite. That is true, so it's a statement. Now, again, let's let's stop for a minute because here's a point of confusion for some people. Some people say, yeah, but isn't that open because it depends upon the set? And what I would say to that is, if, if you're thinking that, that's a very, very common way of thinking, okay? But it's incorrect because what you're doing is you're ignoring the words here some that is part of this sentence as well okay if it just said the set x is finite then that would be an open sentence okay <coughs> or even without the letter x if it said this set is finite that would be an open sentence because then it depends upon which actual set you're talking about but it says some sets are finite. Well, that is in fact true. I can even give you an example of a set that's finite. The empty set has a cardinality of zero. Okay? All right. The derivative of any polynomial of degree 5 is a polynomial of degree 6. What do you think of that? I say that's a statement because it is definitely false. The natural numbers is not an element of the power set of natural numbers. Is that a statement or not a statement? It is definitely a statement. Now, is it true or false? I would say it's false because every set is a subset of itself, which means every set is an element of its own power set. Okay, cosine of x equals negative one. How about that one? Now that one is not a statement, and that is an example of a sentence that is open. It is not true or false, but plugging in specific values for x would make it true or false for each different value, okay? Okay, r cross n intersected with n cross r equals n cross n. 
That's a statement. Takes a little bit more thought if you want to know about if it's true or false. Okay, but that one is true. Okay, the integer x is a multiple of 7. What would you say about that one? I would say that is not a statement. It's an open sentence. If the integer x is a multiple of 7, then it's divisible by 7. Now that has a variable in it, right? But here's the thing. Whether or not that's true does not depend upon the variable. Because it says, if the integer x is a multiple of 7, then it's divisible by 7. and Every integer that is a multiple of 7 is, in fact, divisible by 7. So that statement, well, first of all, I would say this. That sentence is true no matter what, and therefore it's a statement. Okay. Either x is a multiple of 7 or it is not. Well, you have to think about whether or not there's any in between. Well actually now that I think about it it's not even that difficult because it doesn't say either it's a multiple of 7 or it is and then uses some other description. It doesn't say that. It says either it's a multiple of 7 or it is not. Well that's definitely true. In fact that's a logical rule called the law of excluded middle. Okay, which you don't need to know right now, but but that sentence is true. And so that's a statement. Call me Ishmael. That's not a statement. And one more. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's a statement. There's a lot, there's a lot in that statement that um, is, you know, you could get into discussions of whether it's true or not. You can get into into discussion of, of what is meant by the word beginning, what is meant by heaven and earth. You know, all of those things would need to be discussed to figure out if it is true or false. Okay. If you wanted to figure out the truth or falsity, then we would have to have a very, very long discussion. And we, and we still, at the end of that, we might still say that uh, it's impossible for us to figure out if it's true or false. Okay. But we can still agree that it is one of the two, even if we can't figure out which of the two it is, or can't agree upon which of the two it is. Okay. I think that it's I think it's reasonable to say that we would all agree that it is one of the two. So I would say that's a statement. Okay? All right. That's it for today. We finished the first section of chapter 2. Have a good afternoon and come to the uh Zoom discussion if you ever have any questions.